All right, so um, you've just had a fantastic introduction to the WHO um, bioassays, but now um, we're gonna shift gears a bit and I'll explain a bit about the CDC bottle bioassays. Okay, let's see. Are you seeing the presenter view or are you seeing the actual slides? Oh, we're seeing the actual slide. Okay, great. All right. I couldn't tell because it's now showing on two of my screens. So, okay. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and, and get started. So just a, a quick reminder that when we're doing these bioassays on a mosquito population, as part of our routine resistance surveillance, the, the main goal is to find out if resistance exists in a defined place and at a defined time. And of course, to do this, as we've been talking about, we first do bioassays, which are considered the gold standard in really letting us know um, what the resistance status of a mosquito population is with respect to a given insecticide. And these bioassays are typically done either using the WHO methodology, which Agnes just presented, or the CDC bottle bioassay, which is what we're going to talk about right now. So there are some challenges related to both methodologies, but um, just to highlight some points related specifically to the WHO method, um, it relies on the treated papers. And at this point in time, um, there's only one laboratory that produces those treated papers. And there can be some delays in obtaining the treated papers um, just due to shipping uh, restrictions and, um, you know, just the timing of things. So it can, you have to really think quite far ahead in order to place your orders for the treated papers. Um, the test takes 24 hours. As you know, you have to let the mosquitoes um, hold for 24 hours before scoring their mortality. Um, the kits, they cost not a lot of money, but you know, you have to continuously buy the supplies. And then the papers do uh, expire um, and sometimes expire relatively quickly after they arrive at the lab. Um, and to date, there are not papers that are treated with all of the insecticides that programs want to monitor. So there's a gap there. So an alternative uh, methodology that um, programs might want to consider are the bioassays with treated bottles. So what the CDC bottle bioassay does is it measures the time it takes for the insecticide to reach its target within the mosquito um, and to elicit a response in the mosquito. And changes in the amount of time that it takes for the insecticide to affect a mosquito would mean that resistance is developing in a population. So, for instance, if you expose the mosquitoes to an insecticide and they're all dead at the diagnostic time, then that means the population is susceptible to that insecticide. But if you start seeing that it takes more time, maybe 45 minutes, maybe an hour until mosquitoes start getting knocked down, that suggests that resistance is developing in that population. And there are two modifications of the bioassay that I wanted to mention. The one um, being the use of synergists, which I briefly touched on the other day. Um, and I'll explain a bit more in a minute. Um, and then also the use of variable doses to assess the in intensity of resistance. So we have the diagnostic dose of an insecticide, but then we can also um, expose a population to maybe five times that dose or 10 times that dose and see the extent to which um, exposing them to a higher dose of insecticide may then um, still knock them down. And that allows us to assess the intensity of resistance in a population. So there's a lot of um, comparisons that have been made between the WHO and CDC assays. Um, but at a very fundamental level, 
they're measuring two different aspects of resistance. The CDC assay measures one variable, one single variable, which is the time it takes for the insecticide to affect the mosquito. That is what it's measuring. The WHO assay, what it is doing, it is it's trying to replicate what an exposure to an insecticide is in the field. Um, like once a mosquito rests on an insecticide treated surface, um, and then you look at what's happened to that mosquito after that exposure, uh, after 24 hours following that exposure. So there are multiple variables there because the mosquito has 60 minutes to come into contact or not with that insecticide. And then um, you're measuring what happened to that mosquito. Your final outcome variable is 24 hours later. So there's a lot of um, potential variables that are in there. So really, the WHO and CDC methodologies are complementary. Um, at the end of the day, if you have a resistant mosquito population or a population that's developing resistance, if you're using the same methodology consistently over time, you'll be able to detect that change in the population using either methodology. Um, and the CDC methodology was recognized by WHO um, and recommended back in 2013 as a complementary methodology to detect resistance. And there's multiple publications in the scientific literature that have validated that both methodologies are reporting the presence of resistance um, in comparable ways. And I am also aware that there are publications out there that show conflicting evidence, but again, those are often not parts of systematic resistance surveillance programs that look for population trends over time. They're often, you know, one time, one shot looks at a population where there's a lot of variability anyway. Um, so that, that's a point that we can discuss later. But again, if you're going to use one methodology or another, the importance is the most important thing is being consistent in which one you use to ensure comparability. So I'm just gonna give a very brief overview of the methodology because we do have a video that goes into much greater detail on this. So um, the first step is to coat the bottles with the appropriate diagnostic dose of insecticide. Um, and then leave the bottles to dry away from light sources because light can, can break down um, many of these chemicals. Um, once the bottles are dry, you can introduce the mosquitoes into the bottle and each bottle should have between 20 and 25 mosquitoes. So you'll notice in the picture, there are five bottles. Four of those bottles are treated with the insecticide and one bottle is the control bottle that was only treated with acetone, which has evaporated off. So you want to have um, ideally around at least 100 mosquitoes that are um, exposed to the insecticide per population in order to get a, a reasonably accurate estimation of um, what's happening regarding resistance to that insecticide in that population. So you've introduced your mosquitoes. Now you start to monitor what's happening to them. You look at time zero right after you put them in the bottle. You make sure that um, if any of them have been already knocked down, perhaps due to, to handling of the mosquitoes, you want to make sure you record that. But then you count the number of dead mosquitoes every 15 minutes. And we say up to two hours just because if you have a population that's developing resistance, you'll get a nice curve. And over time, if you're systematically monitoring the population, you can look for shifts in that curve over time because you'll have more data points. So, and Agnes just touched on this, but this is always um, a, a, a bit of a subjective point on what constitutes a dead mosquito. So I've put dead in, um, in quotation marks here because especially with this assay, 
mosquitoes may not necessarily be dead, um, but they're certainly not down. So we say we consider a mosquito dead for the purposes of this assay if they cannot stand or fly in a coordinated manner. And uh, we say it does help to gently rotate the bottle while you're counting. And any immobile mosquitoes that slide along the curvature of the bottle as you're, as you're shifting it um, should be categorized as dead. And typically, if a population doesn't have a high level of resistance in it, um, it's easier to count the number of dead mosquitoes in the initial readings because a lot of mosquitoes will be dead, um, and then count the number of live mosquitoes when only a few remain alive. And then um, in the end, the percent of dead mosquitoes recorded at the diagnostic time is the most important value. That is your outcome measure. And so just as an example of some um, real life data, these are Anopheles gambi from um, Cote d'Ivoire and um, exposed to permethrin. And you can see for permethrin, the diagnostic time is 30 minutes. So at 30 minutes, the susceptible strain had 100% mortality, which is what you would expect. But at 30 minutes, the field strain, which was resistant, only had about 45% mortality. At 45 minutes, it was about 80%. 60 minutes, 75 minutes, it wasn't really doing much. And in this particular case, we stopped the assay at that point because we knew it was resistant and it wasn't you know, approaching 100% yet. So that was okay. Really, this is the data point that we're most interested in, what the percent mortality is at the diagnostic time. So then um, I'd mentioned before about the possibility of also doing the bioassays with synergists to get some information about metabolic resistance mechanisms. Um, and as we discussed on Tuesday, synergists are chemicals that inhibit detoxifying enzymes. Um, there are synergists that act against the oxidases, the esterases, and GSTs. And basically what synergists do is they can cancel out resistance in cases where these detoxifying enzymes are um, primarily responsible for the resistance. So in the bottle assays, we have more options for synergists than are currently available in the WHO assays right now. So um, there's PBO, which inhibits oxidases, DEF, which inhibits esterases, and then these three compounds, any of which um, inhibit glutathione um, S transferases. And this is just a, a schematic that I shared the other day showing the methodology whereby um, you would coat your bottles with the synergist and um, introduce the mosquitoes there first and then transfer them after an hour of exposure to a holding container before then putting them into your, um, into your typical bioassay uh, scenario. So this is the last slide, just a, a, a bit to show what um, synergist assay results might look like. So for instance, over here on the left, um, this could be your results from your just typical bioassay, your susceptible strain showing 100% mortality, maybe at your 30 minute diagnostic time, and your field strain showing resistance throughout the course of the assay. So this is what you, your data would look like just from a typical bioassay. But then say you do a synergist assay with that same population. Any of these three options are what your results could look like. So if your results after synergist, um, after doing a synergist assay look like, uh, look like A here and everything's dead at your diagnostic time, well, then that's an indication that whatever uh, enzymes that synergist was inhibiting are primarily responsible for your resistance. 
if your curve looks like um, B here, it means that, all right, well, you've gained a bit more susceptibility over time, but you didn't get up to 100%. So the synergist is um, acting on an enzyme that's contributing to the resistance, but that enzyme isn't wholly responsible for the resistance. If your curve looks like this, it means that the synergist did not uh, recover any susceptibility in that population. And so what, whatever that synergist was acting on is not uh, an important mechanism contributing to the resistance in that population. So, okay, I will stop there.